listening to us and Dr. Paul speak on executive power. Uh, I'd first like to start by thanking Dr. Paul from com er, for coming here tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank the members of the Federal Society who helped out, um, especially our treasurer, Tim McNamara, who did a lot to make this possible. So I'd like to thank him. Um, also, I'd like to thank the, uh, the students at Pierce Law for um, helping out and being very supportive of this event. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Ron Paul. Uh, this uh, 
uh, administration took hold. We've, uh, we've had this executive branch of government that, has, that runs agencies. The Congress creates the agencies and they give them vague outlines and, uh, and, and then they write all the laws, all the, all the regulations. Then we have a federal register. We, we, we have the code and then we have the federal registry and all the laws we pass. And then the agencies of government writes all these laws, and then we have a separate branch of the judicial system. You know, uh, you know, a whole judicial system. And in that branch of government, we're generally conceded, uh, considered guilty until proven innocent. I mean, where in the world did we uh, get this idea that uh, we would create a tax code? Uh, of course, at one time they tried to create it without amending the Constitution, then they did, and people argue whether they did it legitimately. And then, they have no no concern whatsoever on how they collect our taxes. We're we're all you know compelled to testify against ourselves. We're compelled to keep all the records, and we're all guilty until proven innocent. And then all the regulations are written, and they become the law of the land. And the Federal Register just grows by leaps and bounds. I mean, thousands and thousands of pages. You know that was never meant to be, and <clears throat> nobody seems to challenge it. Uh, the Congress just keeps writing laws and then allowing the executive branch to write regulations and now we're inundated with laws and uh, nobody can even interpret them. Uh, the, uh, I mean, if, if you seek advice from the, the IRS to make sure that you understand the code, <clears throat> you know the old story about you go to three different IRS agents for an interpretation, you'll three, get three different interpretations on, on what to do. And, and no wonder the people are disgusted and uh, unable to uh, cope and would like something new and different. And I think it's because we've allowed uh, uh, way too much power uh, to, to gravitate into the, uh, in, into the hands of the ex executive branch. But you know, the, the time that the executive branch of government uh, seems to get more control is in times of crises. And uh, if they don't have a crisis, if they don't have a war, they create one. Uh, you know, whether it's a war against terrorism, and uh, of course, uh, sometimes if you pin them down, or where's the where's the terrorism? Where's where's the you know what's the definition exactly? What does that mean? Uh, it, it tends to strike up fear, and when people are fearful, uh, they're expected to be to give up some of their liberties and give more power to the executive branch. And this is essentially what has happened, especially since 9/11. Um, right after, uh, right after 9/11, uh, immediately the Patriot Act was brought to the floor. That was the uh, the biggest piece of legislation and the most egregious piece of legislation passed shortly after 9/11. And it wasn't like that was brand new thinking. I mean, that had been floating around. They had talked about it. even the Department of Homeland Security, which is a consequence of 9/11, that had been floating around. But the excuse was, you know, we've been attacked and therefore you have to give up your, your liberties. And how many times have you heard people say, well, you know, it's, it's okay if I'm going to be safe. It's better that they, you know, that they harass me at the airports and I know I'm going to be safe. And nobody remembers that we were advised that uh, <clears throat> if we're willing to give up our liberties and, and uh, uh, for safety and security, we're going to end up with neither. And I'm, I'm afraid we're working, and, you know, to that goal where we're giving up too much. So the Patriot Act was passed. Uh, one of the worst parts of the Patriot Act is that uh, it, uh, it, it made it much easier to uh, search, with, you know, just totally ignore the Fourth Amendment and write these, uh, uh, you know, uh, security letters. And, and not, a, not a judge, but just, just the, per the, the department of the FBI, whoever was doing the investigation, just write the letter that permits them to search. And now, with the various pieces of legislation that we have passed, um, the matter of fact, the executive branch was doing it, and the Congress generally has to come in and rubber, uh, rubber stamp uh, these efforts. Our homes can be searched now, and uh, if, if they come in and we know about it, we're told we're not allowed to tell anybody. <laughs> or we go to jail just for telling people the government came in and looked at our place. Or they might come in and do sneak and peek. And they don't even have to identify us. They can get blanket search warrants, even if they go through the normal process. They go through blanket search warrants any place and every place. 
and there's virtually no privacy left, whether it's your internet or your phone service, phone, service, phone, phone companies, when they were searching for phone records, which probably at times is legitimate, you know, if they have a lead and they want to look at it, you can get subpoenas and go, just, you know, it might take a day or two. Uh, and in, in the very emergency, they're allowed to go ahead and do it and, and get the, the uh, warrant uh, later on. But they turned over massive records on the, on the phone company uh, to, to the government, and now they're going back and passing legislation to say that they don't have to be penalized. They exempt them, them from it. Same way what they do on the, uh, the consequence of all that's going on is uh, that our CIA has been, you know, uh, known to torture people. And of course, you know, in, in a free society, under a system of the government, we're supposed to have an open government know what the government's doing. We're supposed to have our privacy, and they're not supposed to have secrecy. And it's the opposite now. So the secrecy of government is protected. Then if they get caught, you know, they destroy, they destroy the records. So now there's legislation uh, that's uh, being proposed, if not yet passed, which says that if you're a CIA agent and you committed, the, you know, these crimes uh, of, of, uh, of torture, that, uh, you know, you're going to be exempt from prosecution. And one, one former member of Congress um, mentioned about that, and he had some experience in this area, and he said, well, this is very important to exempt them because it's going to be hard to recruit people to do this dangerous duty of torturing people if they're not exempt from breaking the law. So, you know, the, the, thing, is, the thing is out of control. And uh, we, need, we need to get a handle on it. We need somebody in the executive branch that doesn't need more power that wants to get rid of these powers and return the control, um, you, you know, to the people. And uh, it, it's, it's absolutely out of control. The, uh, in, in the last few years, um, and the, the, mili the uh, Military Commissions Act uh, means that any American citizen now can be declared an enemy combatant. And uh, the President or the Attorney General can declare that we're an enemy to combatant. And we might just be looking like we might be helping somebody, maybe talk to them, or our name appeared on a telephone list, and we might be accused that we belong to an organization that might be questionable. And we could be accused of being an enemy combatant, which means that uh, there could be secret renditions, secret prisons, and tortures with the, with the loss of habeas corpus. You know, it, it, our country was great because we really brought a lot of good ideas together, the ideas of personal liberty. Uh, and it was a great step forward, but some of the things that they brought together were old. Uh, that the, you, you know the the right uh, the rights of uh, uh, of Englishmen. You know that was traditional, and a habeas corpus was certainly uh, you know a little thing at twelve fifteen uh, with the Magna Carta. But we are rejecting this now, and so we are we are certainly at a at a serious crisis. Now, if you go out on the street and talk to people that haven't thought about this, they say, "Oh, no big deal." I want to be safe, so I don't care what they do to me. I want them to spy on the bad guys, and, you know, and on and on. And we don't have concentration camps, but uh, but their potential, and we don't know what's happened. We've had concentration camps, uh, you know, we had we locked up the Japanese, but uh, someday it may get a much much worse. Uh, so the principle is absolutely important. If the, if the conditions are laid down where individuals can be uh, taken and, and not have proper protection under the law, uh, we end up with way too much power in, in the executive branch of, of the government. So many of these things that uh, we talk about uh, aren't really, uh, the people in Washington aren't showing enough concern about it. The, the executive branch does it and the Congress goes along and uh, rubber stamps it. We're well on our way to a national ID card, a real ID. It's uh, putting mandates on the states to do certain things. If you don't do it, uh, you know, you'll be denied funds, funds that the government took from us. And uh, fortunately, some states are resisting the, the Real ID Act, and hopefully. But uh, we're getting to the point where uh, we, we can't even leave our own country uh, without a passport. 
And, you know, there's been a lot of talk on immigration about building a fence to keep people out. Somebody told me the other day, I think they're building a the fence to keep us in. <laughs> and, and then I got to think, well, I wonder if that could be possible. <laughs> but when you think about it, they want us to have passports because we want to leave. And financially, when you get into the financial crisis, there are always capital controls. And we already know that if you happen to not deal in checkbook money and you happen to be working here and you earn ten or fifteen thousand dollars and you earn it and paid all your taxes and you just want to leave the country and go out you can't get out of the country you're going to be arrested <coughs> they're going to take your money you're going to have to prove it was really yours and sometimes you can but most of the time time you can so there's there's way way too much uh, uh, power uh, in, in the exam in, in the hands of the the executive and uh, what we do about this is going to be uh, very, very difficult to handle uh, in, in these trends. But the legislation is constant and, and continual. Uh, what we do, uh, the um, in, Insurrection Act, it has been essentially gutted. Uh, the Insurrection Act does permit the president to make a declaration, no matter fact, Congress to make a declaration of uh, of an emergency, and and uh, that's been on the books since probably 1805, and uh, that was reinforced by the Posse Comitatus Act. That's all, been, that's all been undermined. It's very easy for a president, you know, to declare some type of emergency for health reasons, for, for weather reasons, and, or for public disorder. And, they, and he can make this declaration. So there's, there's not that much protection. We have, we have sowed, sowed the seeds of really li uh, allowing a dictator to come and take charge. I, I'm not saying that you know we're on the verge of that, or that's the deliberate plan. But the undermining has permitted this to exist, and and the uh, and the potential is there. Uh, so I think that um, we have some serious problems. The president has way too much power on executive orders. He, uh, you know, some executive orders are constitutional. You know, if you send out an order for a constitutional function for military reasons, you can send out an order that would be legitimate. But most executive orders aren't legitimate. Most of them are legislation. And um, I, I, in my interpretation, uh, I would think a, a constitutional president could uh, use an executive order to repeal all those bad executive orders. <laughs> also, the... Um, the, the signing statements that have gone on, uh, signing statements aren't brand new, but they were very sparse up until recent years. And the signing statements sometimes were used to say that, uh, you know, if there was a clarification, they don't quite understand this, and, and they clarified. But the proper way of dealing with portions of a bill that are unconstitutional or you don't like is, is not to say, well, I'm going to ignore this, this, and this, and I'll obey this. Uh, the proper way is, if you think it's unconstitutional and you don't believe it's a good bill, you're supposed to veto the bill. That's what we're supposed to do. But instead, now we've accepted this idea that we have these signing statements, and it's sort of like a line item veto. And if that's not stopped, uh, I mean, this is another legislative prerogative that goes from the legislative branch over, over into the judicial branch. And uh, that, of course, is... Uh, is a dangerous move uh, in, in the wrong in the wrong direction. Um, the um, the fact that we have gone so far, the, the real question is: is can we, can we reverse it? If we don't do something about it, if we don't raise up a new generation of people who care about the law and the Constitution, no, it's going to be very very difficult. Uh, but I want to encourage. I mean, uh, this is not a, a talk or a speech that I, I only give to a group like this. I mean, I talk about it all the time, and young people understand it, and uh, it's uh, it's something that, you know, I could go to a crowd that you wouldn't suspect that even knew about the Patriot Act and get loud applause when I tell them, you know, I oppose the Patriot Act, and it's an attack on our liberty. So, so there are a lot of reasons uh, to be encouraged. You know, there's, there's another power that Congress has relinquished, and it hasn't even been given to the executive branch, but the executive branch acknowledges it and works on it, and that is the, the monetary power. Uh, the monetary issue is very explicit in the Constitution, just like the war, uh, war power. Uh, it, it's supposed to be uh, uh, the maintenance of a sound currency is the responsibility was given to the Congress. But lo and behold, 
uh, we totally ignore it. Uh, Congress creates, a, a, you know, the central bank, and then in collusion with uh, the Secretary of Treasury and Wall Street and others, they manipulate the money supply and, and uh, the financial markets. And it's not like it's totally ignored by the executive branch. Most of the people I know in Congress don't care that much about it. They don't understand it and think it's an esoteric issue. But it happens to be a vital issue because everything that we do is measured by the dollar. And right now, uh, because of the system we have and because we don't follow the rule of law, the dollar is being eroded in value. And uh, that's something that uh, a, a proper leader in this country would change the direction and emphasize <coughs> the, uh, the need to have uh, you know, the legislative branch uh, owning up to their responsibilities. And um, this, this is something that uh, is vital to us. And, uh, and we will have to do something pretty soon because there is too much power not only in the executive branch, but in all branches of government in Washington. And uh, we're going to face a, a financial crisis. And under financial crises, there's political crises. And when there's a political crisis, you know, then the conditions are set for people using these powers on the books. And if you look at some of the examples, uh, one of the extreme example would be with what happened in Germany. Uh, you, you know, finally they put it to the, they passed the laws to the point where uh, the, uh, the, the leader could pass any law and arrest people ar arbitrarily. Then they had a financial crisis, you know, run away, uh, one, one of a uh, current uh, uh, inflation and cause disruption and people need need to be reassured and and more power is is taken over uh, and and we have, we have rejected this the good part of our constitution the separations of powers and the limitation of power the constitution is written so explicitly to restrain the government protect our privacy make sure government is open and yet government is more secretive than ever before. Some people say, why do you oppose the CIA? Isn't the CIA a wonderful branch of government? <laughs> I mean, uh, no, I don't think it is. I think it's a dangerous uh, agency of government. Not that I'm against all surveillance. I mean, I think some of it is good and proper, and for defense reasons, you should have it. But a CIA, which is under the executive <coughs> branch of government, just think of what it does. We send the CIA all around the world. They, they do get involved in financial interests, uh, the protection of large corporations and what else is going on in the world, but we're involved in elections overseas all the time. And we, we always send out people to undermine governments. Right now, we have CIA agents in, uh, in Iraq, in Iran, you know, to undermine and work for the overthrow of that government. And uh, we were involved in, in, in Vietnam this way and in many, many places. We always have to have our friend in power. Uh, our CIA was involved uh, in 1953 in the overthrow of Mossadegh. And it's like most Americans don't remember that. They didn't study it in our history. But believe me, the people in the Middle East remember this. And, and they don't forget. And we seem to never remember and they seem to never forget. But I think we ought to do a little remembering and a little waking up to find out how we create some of our problems for ourselves. But what they do in Washington is they turn it around if you don't support the Patriot Act, you know, right after 9-11, the Patriot Act's up. And uh, we had no, no time at all to study it. So I voted against it because I had a suspicion it was bad, but I have a principle, you know, if you can't read the bill, you should be voting for it. <laughs> and uh, so I, I asked him, I told my colleagues, I said, why are you voting for this? You don't even know what's in it. They said, yeah, but this is a crisis, and the people are worried and scared, and they want us to do something. So, you know, they go ahead, and besides, they don't want to be considered unpatriotic. So if you don't support the Patriot Act, you're unpatriotic. If you don't support the unconstitutional wars, the wars that are orchestrated and delivered to us by the executive branch, we're considered, oh, you don't support the troops, you're unpatriotic. So it goes on and on. It's the play on patriotism and, uh, and, and this support for troops that compel us to go along and, and support this type of legislation. And uh, in a way, the only way this can be stopped is the American people have to wake up. If, uh, it, it, even if I am to be the president, uh, one person can't do it. Matter of fact, I can't be the president unless there's a lot of people who really want somebody like me to be the president.
But if there's enough people that want it, the people are waking up, but there's still a lot of obstacles because there's a lot of people who like power in Washington. There's a lot of people who benefit. They benefit by this banking system through the inflation. They benefit by the military industrial complex. They like, they like to have their enemies out there, and they like to build these weapons, and they like a medical industrial complex these days. The biggest lobbyist group in Washington today are, are the, you know, the medical people. They come and they lobby for these programs. And some people thought it was the poor people who was lobbying for all this government medicine. But it's the big corporations, and, you know, that do. But uh, we, we will have to have an awakening if we're going to reverse this. And, and the crisis will come with a financial crisis. And it will be of our, uh, our own doing. And that is why we have, have to address this. We have to reduce the power and scope of government, reduce the power of the executive branch in particular, put the pressure on the Congress to own up to their, their responsibilities to do the things they're supposed to do, and move in a different direction. But we ought to study and learn our history. And uh, of course, we need a, uh, a new group of attorneys and uh, legal people and constitutional scholars to uh, understand these issues. And, and there can be some refinements. I don't, I don't think the Constitution is perfect, and uh, but what I do think is something that we have to respect is the rule of law. You know, if we ignore it uh, and just say, well, we can ignore this, this, and this, then uh, there's nothing left, and that's about where we are. One time, many years ago, when I first went back to Congress, I was on the Education Committee, and uh, a bill came up and. And I was, uh, you know, in a naive mood, and I, I brought up, raised my hand, and said, I wanted, you know, to say something. And I said, you know, th this bill, what we're doing here, is not constitutional, you know that. And the chairman, of the, the chairman of the committee said, well, that may be true, but that's not our responsibility. We'll let the court sort it out <laughs> later on. <laughs> and uh, wow. then, more recently, I became naive once again. <laughs> <laughs> But, but much more determined because it was much more serious. And that had to do when uh, the Congress was willing to transfer the power to go to war to the president. Uh, and uh, that's what it was. It was literally transferring power to go to war in Iraq. It wasn't told tell them to do it or not to do it. But just to say, use your judgment. If you like war, if you want war, you go ahead. Implying that, of course, the Congress will provide the money and the troops and, and, and what is necessary. And... Uh, I, for years, knew this war was coming, uh, ever since the uh, Iraqi Liberation Act was passed in 1998. Uh, and it was designed to uh, have regime change in Iraq, so it wasn't this administration. That's been going on for a long time. So uh, I looked up the uh, language of the Declaration of War from World War II and used that language and offered that as a substitute amendment in the committee. And this, uh, this annoyed a lot of people. You know, the fact that I thought they should declare war. So when I introduced it, I said, uh, you're going to have to defeat this because I'm not going to vote for this resolution. But I'm telling you that you shouldn't go to war this way. Uh, it's not proper. It tends to be political. It tends to have no victories. It tends to linger and cost too much money. And we shouldn't be doing this. And uh, so we had the voice vote, and uh, nobody voted for it. And then I demanded a recorded vote. And that's when... Uh, People got a little bit upset. Uh, <laughs> and they didn't want on, on record. And the chairman of the committee said, he said that that part of the Constitution was anachronistic. <laughs> Those were the words, anachronistic, and, you know, we're not supposed to follow that anymore. And the ranking member said it was frivolous to think that I would bring up this idea, you know. And in a way, they were right. We don't look at it anymore. You know, but what that is our problem. And what has happened on this war. It's a, it's a tragedy as far as I can tell. Not only is it tragic in the sense of lives lost, ours and theirs, but the cost, the diminished uh, uh, ability for us to have <clears throat> a well-prepared, well-equipped, uh, well uh, high morale of our military, which has, has been diminished, but it also has been it's also been used to make the excuse that <clears throat> in a time of war, there are more, you know, even though there weren't terrorists there before, no Al-Qaeda, they're all over the place now. So now there's an enemy. And now there's an excuse for all this surveillance. 
and, and you know, continuously, even this past week, there was one of those domestic surveillance bills that was again was passed. So it's, it's used. And uh, Randolph Bourne was right. He says, war is the health of the state. And they need, they need enemies and they need fear. And if they don't have a hot war going on, they'll declare war against drugs or war against poverty or war against whatever. But you've got to be fearful and in order for to get the people scared enough and uh, make sure that they think they're not patriotic if they don't support the war. And if you, if you don't support what they're saying, you know, we're going to be attacked and we're all going to be killed. And that was the reason we were on the verge of bombing Iran. You know, that they were on the verge of launching a missile and killing us with a nuclear weapon. And the reason why we're preparing to spend a trillion dollars building anti-ballistic missile sites in Eastern Europe, right up on the border of the Soviet or the Russians. I mean, what would we think if the Chinese and the Russians did that in Mexico or in Canada or someplace? Would we have a self-interest? But we continue to do this by scaring the people. When the people are scared, they give up their liberties and they allow this gravitation of power to get in the hands of the executive branch. So my goal and the goal I think should be of all Americans is to restore the principles of the Constitution. And if we want to change the Constitution, we have to do it deliberately. If you decide, you know, that it's a good idea, I think it would be a terrible idea. But you think, say, say you think it's a good idea that the federal government runs our public school system. You really should. You really should change the Constitution. We shouldn't ignore it. And uh, yet, yet today, the public school system is essentially run uh, by by the federal government. There was a time when uh, <clears throat> the people in this country thought that it would be important. Uh, to make sure you don't drink too much, you know. Uh, uh, so they decided, well, uh, we just can't do that under the Constitution, telling people what they can drink. So they amended the Constitution. I mean, that's it's amazing. Then it didn't work, surprisingly enough. <laughs> and uh, so, so they repealed uh, that 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 amendment. But they had more respect then. Today, think of all the prohibitions. Of, uh, of of all the all the drugs that uh, pe people might use and are bit in prison, but even the simple thing of a sick person using marijuana, we overrule state laws, and that's something that I wouldn't do is to over take the executive branch and overrule a state law that legalizes medicinal marijuana for somebody dying with cancer and go and arresting these people and putting them in prison. You know, uh, alcohol still kills more people than marijuana. Uh, but it just happens that uh, I think there's more members of Congress that enjoy having a beer or two and they're not going to change those laws. <laughs> so, but anyway, I think you get the gist and we want to take some questions. The gist is, is that uh, uh, we as a people have allowed our leaders uh, in all branches of government to undermine our Constitution. That we had a pretty good start and we're losing our way. We don't follow the Constitution. We can answer so many questions uh, that we have, whether they're economic or personal liberty questions, by just looking to the guidance of the Constitution. Change, them, change it in a deliberate fashion if, if we have to, but that we have a serious problem and uh, it can start by uh, having somebody in the executive branch that cares enough to not set the goal of, uh, and, and have such an ego to say, well, I want to run people's lives. I, as a president, uh, would be opposite of other presidents because uh, I, I think I should take a pay cut, to tell you the truth, if I'm going to be the president. Because I don't want to run your life, and I don't think I have the authority to do it. It's not constitutional. I wouldn't know how to do it. I don't want to run the economy. I don't know how, and I shouldn't do it. I don't have the authority, and I don't want to police the world. So, you know, that would reduce the responsibilities I have. So I would say that maybe then you should vote for a pay cut for the president. Thank you very much.
questions we'd like to ask you first. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> you know, if we could do it that way, maybe have Marcus ask a few questions, and then once you know he's done through, we'll okay. open it up to the public. Okay. Will this sort of be like a test? Who <laughs> 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 As much for me as you. I mean, I said, you should not mind. Uh, but the Federal Society had. We sensed that most of the people in the room would be very much in sympathy with your views. So somebody has to press a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, when I get into the Commander-in-Chief meetings, the traditional view that uh, the President needs to be the single negotiator in international relations. Uh, we do a lot of treaties. We do a lot of executive agreements. Um, you convinced us that Congress is uh, not always driven by the most patriotic views. How can we interact in a more complicated world with so much international trade regulation without something like fast track authority? I mean, every, we got 535 people in Congress. How many? earmarks that we're going to have the next time we uh, have a trade treaty? I, I think that, that is a good question, but the, uh, the answer, of course, is if you want the President to take this responsibility, my opinion would be that we'd have to give the President the authority with a constitutional change because foreign commerce is to be regulated by the Congress. And you're suggesting Congress is inept and they're not likely to. But, you know, I, it, it, free trade is not complicated. And uh, if, if we wanted a free trade agreement with Canada, uh, Congress could pass it and say that uh, we want no tariffs with Canada. And just pass the law. And there'd be no tariffs on any Canadian imports. Or they could pass a, pass a bill that says uh, the, uh, the tariffs with Canada would be 10% uh, and uh, uh, or exactly what the Canadians do. But the Congress could do that. I don't think it would be that complicated. Well, I think it's more complicated now when we give this authority to the President. They negotiate these treaties internationally and they go on and on and on. And then they get into environmental law and labor law and, uh, and, and all, all kinds of discussions that even when some of those treaties are, are reasonable, even sometimes when they're bilateral that I might be able to support, then they get all into the social policy. So I think when you, once you allow them to do that, they do, they, they do more than they should. But um, treaties, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of treaties, you know, involve the Senate. So it's not like the President can design these treaties. And uh, in the entangling alliances that we have, whether it's the NATO or UN or IMF or World Bank or WTO, all these things are, are things that have been passed, uh, you know, by both the Congress uh, and in both the House and the Senate, so I would, I would like, I would uh, say that there's nothing wrong with arguing that case, but uh, I think technically we should refine the Constitution to say that it's up to the president to negotiate, you know, to be involved with uh, foreign commerce. Uh, the uh, legislators that. Uh, mock your views is anachronistic. Um, I suspect some of them are quite sincere, and they think there's no reasonable way to amend the Constitution, that the world is very different and much more dangerous. And if they have to bend it, they're just going to do it. Uh, now, the usual cliches are that the events happen much quicker. Uh, communications is much faster. Threats to the economy in currency markets or threats to national security in terms of uh, mass destruction terrorism are so grave that um, if the constitutional niceties have to be bent, then that's just the way it's going to have to be. What's the answer? Well, I think you're right that people do think that way, uh, but uh, if it's a national security problem, you know, if we're being invaded and attacked, the president does not have to, you know, wait for Congress to go into session. Uh, he has the responsibility to retaliate. 
But you know, essentially there's been no time in history that a country has attacked us, invaded us, or even was on the verge of it, where we had to, uh, you know, immediately respond. In the old days, I think it, I, I think it was much slower then. We needed those emergency powers even more when we didn't have the communications. Today, we can all be in Washington in six hours, you know, and before it used to take six weeks. So I, I would use uh, the argument that, that maybe that the communications are, you know, allow us to move more deliberately and incorporate, you know, the Congress uh, as much, more so than we did in the past, and that uh, we could go through a, a, a deliberate process. And I think the, the attempt to slow things down a little bit and talk about it uh, is very important. Uh, they didn't want to talk about the war. Uh, if they would have, now they're talking about the war. The people who voted for it, you know, they're saying, they want to talk, they're debating the war, and uh, they should have done that before it happened. That's what I wanted. So I, 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 don't, I think there's time enough to do it. But, but once again, it's the, the process. Uh, uh, I think you're right about them being probably sincere and that we live in different times and, and that the Constitution should be flexible. Well, I don't. I think the Constitution should be rigid and that if we want to change it, we should, or we don't have anything left. And I'm afraid that's where we are. She asked if, whether I would support a constitutional amendment to give the president a line item veto power. No, I, I would not. Uh, I don't want the president to have more power. <laughs> My goal is to reduce the power of the president. And uh, it would be constitutional to have a constitutional amendment. And, uh, and actually some argue that he already has that power, and I don't think so uh, at all. And that's what these signing statements are sort of trying to get around is the, uh, you, you know, the rule against uh, line item vetoes. But no, the Congress should uh, assume their responsibilities. And, uh, and we shouldn't, I think it would increase spending. They say, oh no, if they only had this line item veto, uh, they would be striking things. It would be more politicized. I've had few calls over the years from presidents, conservative presidents, um, certain pieces of legislation. They have never called me to cut spending. They always call me to raise spending. I believe the line item veto would be a political tool that if I wouldn't vote for their boondoggles and they could line out, you know, line out something in my district, they would do it. And uh, because they, they do that already, you know, the, the leadership in the House uh, might do it, but you would be given this power, political power, uh, to the executive branch uh, to force members of Congress to toe the line on spending programs. And rather than really ending up cutting, I think it would uh, there would be an unintended consequence. Uh, no. Gentlemen, the senator is back. Uh, Dr. Paul, would you support a uh, constitutional amendment to provide some sort of penalty for legislators who uh, propose or? Uh, vote for legislation that is then found to be unconstitutional? Because as it stands right now, it's like you said, Congress doesn't care if they pass unconstitutional legislation, and we the people have to abide by whatever laws are passed, and you can spend your, I mean, I think everybody in this room can pretty much tell what legislation is unconstitutional, but you could spend your entire life and your entire fortune getting one stupid law overturned, and in the meantime, Congress has, has passed a thousand others, and there's no there's no penalty. There's no penalty for anyone in Congress for for uh, passing unconstitutional legislation. And if the uh, if the Congress if, if the congressman disobeyed, who would enforce the law? Who would throw him out? Well, what would the penalty be? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> um, you know, one time with Tongue in Cheek, I wrote an article about. Uh, and I think I had uh, medical malpractice on my mind, you know, but facing up the lawsuits. Uh, I thought we should have a thing called legislative malpractice. If you commit this crime, you can, the, the citizen can sue him in court and take him in and say, hey, listen, what you promised never to raise taxes and you voted, you broke your rules or you broke the Constitution. 
But, you know, the vehicle there, I, I think it's a great idea. I don't think it's going to work very well about what the penalty is going to be and who's going to enforce it. Does the executive branch enforce it on, on the legislative branch? I think what you're talking about is a lackadaisical citizenry because, you know, if they mess up, you have a two-year period, you should be throwing these guys out. That's what we should be doing. is very good. I just don't know what the penalty would be and how you would enforce it. of the individual's personality and character. Uh, and if you can't persuade and you can't influence, you can't get along with people, it doesn't work very well. But you know, uh, a lot of people will come because, you know, I have, uh, I, I think I easily have the record of voting by myself more than anybody else probably in the history of the country. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> sort of suggesting your question, you must not get along with anybody, everybody's your enemy. And I said, no, instead of that, I said, there's nobody that votes with me the same voting pattern, but everybody's my friend, and everybody votes with me when they want to use the Constitution to defend their position, and they love to have me on their side because I'll defend it on a principle. So on economic things, you know, I'll have a group of people that'll be working with me, and, you know, on, on the liberal side, uh, uh, you know there's uh, a better vote from the Democrats on some of the things I talked here tonight, protection, privacy, uh, and personal liberty. Dennis Kucinich, for instance, is a good friend, and uh, we disagree on economic policy. But when it comes to national sovereignty, and when it comes to personal privacy, and when it comes to the war issue, he is very, very dedicated. And, and I work very closely with a, a large group of Democrats in those areas. Uh, so I, I don't see it as impossible rather than being divisive i think there's a chance you could bring people together uh with, with these views uh i think the divisiveness comes from the ultra rigid traditional liberal and the ultra rigid traditional conservative who, who doesn't reach across on any of the issues and they're always fighting you know like they're fighting down there just this week on selling the budget and uh the typical liberal wants huge expenditures on the welfare state here at home and uh, the administration wants huge increases in the military budget to fight more wars. So they compromise and they increase both. <laughs> I'd like to get the compromise and decrease both. <laughs> As president, would you just use the bully pulpit to shut it down, or would you cite the supremacy clause to not uh, enforce the unconstitutional laws Congress passes, or would you do anything? How would you? Well, I, I think it depends on the issue. You know, I mentioned the marijuana enforcement. I, I think I would have the prerogatives of where to direct the activities of the, the uh, attorney general on which which laws. You know, whether the gun laws or the marijuana laws or something like that, I think that you'd have some choices there. But when it comes to the Department of Education or medical benefits and things that technically aren't constitutional, no, I'm not attacking those. And I, I have, I think I'm a better friend to people who are dependent on it because I want to save enough money in order for uh, uh, these these programs to last for a little while longer before we go into bankruptcy. Even the Federal Reserve. Uh, I don't advocate closing down the Federal Reserve in one day, not because I'm sympathetic to it, but because it would, in the, the treatment would be worse than, uh, than the problem we have. But you could, you have transitional programs, you could have competing currencies, and I won't go into that, but you can have that and let people use gold and, and get rid of the tax, change the tax laws so money isn't taxed, but you could work that out. 
When it comes to medical benefits, I talk about it a lot about it that I, I don't want to put anybody out in the streets. In a way, there was a contract, even though it was flawed, on um, Social Security. So people put a lot of money in there with good faith and they're supposed to get it back. But there's no money there, and we have $550 billion a year in deficit, a $9 trillion deficit, $800 billion we have to borrow from overseas. We have to do something. I would cut this money from overseas, save it, cut the deficit, restore a little bit of confidence to the dollar, and I would tie these people over. And I wouldn't go after the people who are dependent. But there's no reason why we should pursue the policy that we did with this administration. Uh, Republicans used to say we get rid of the Department of Education, but what did we do? Nearly double the size of it? So we don't need that, and we should cut back some that are less painful. But when it comes to people who we have taught to be so dependent, you know, on medical care. So finally we got around to vetoing, after all these years, then we picked on child care. You know, even I, who am unsympathetic with that process, I'm very sympathetic with the, with the priorities. So, uh, yes, I think that uh, I, would, I would do this and say, well, I didn't create it, I didn't vote for it, but in the meantime, of getting back to common sense, why make the problem worse? You don't, uh, you don't overkill, but move in that direction. Naively thinking, I assume most of your competitors are fairly well educated, intelligent, smart, and so on and so forth. Why don't they, from a psychology perspective, take the opportunity to better compete against you and fall back on the Constitution as an opportunity for them to do better in the polls? That's very difficult for me to understand. Where if they, if you're bad. That seems like a tool for them to use against you, and you know, you you probably have to ask them, <laughs> you know, why. But you know, on occasion they do. You know, when they want to throw it out, they'll throw out some things. And I said, you know, those words are exactly words that I might be able to say and use. And I'll ask somebody, either a supporter or or, or somebody that I might talk to after the debate. I said, so and so said such, you know, such and such inside of the Constitution. I said, why aren't you satisfied with that? And he says, we don't believe him. <laughs> Dr. Paul, um, I just want to ask you one question about this idea of nation building and why has this administration taken such a strong stance on it? And what your opinion of eliminating this idea of nation building in the president? I, I don't think there's one answer to why they go into nation building. I think it's very clear to be against nation building is pretty popular with the American people. And that's why uh, that was the program for the election of the year 2000, condemning what Clinton was doing. And his were pretty minor compared to what's going on now. It was Somalia and Kosovo. And uh, they were condemned by uh, by our, our current president. Um, but then when they have the opportunity, they use 9-11 as an excuse, but you know that 9-11 wasn't the reason we're a nation building in Iraq because they knew they didn't have weapons and, and they knew that it had nothing to do with 9-11. And uh, so I, I think it's, uh, given the benefit of the doubt, they believe in some of their own rhetoric that we need to remake the Middle East uh, and that there's a better Middle East under their rules. They don't realize that we made the Middle East or participated in it in 1918, 1919, you know, with the Versailles Treaty. We created this difficult problem. But they keep thinking they're, they're naive enough to believe that, uh, you know, that they can do a better job. But then also I think it's, I think it has a lot to do with oil. I do. I mean, I don't. I don't see. Uh, so even even Somalia is an absent, uh, totally absent from from oil interests and uh, strategic position. You know, if you're in the innermost parts of Africa and millions of people are dying, you know, we're not in nation building there. We're not investing uh, life and limb uh, in those countries. So I think oil has a lot to do with it, and uh, a sincere neoconservative philosophy. 
that uh, they, they believe they're making a better world. I think w Wilson was an idealist. Uh, I think he, he really believed that he was doing the Lord's work, you know, to make this a better world. And uh, it, it turned out that uh, that was probably one of the biggest errors of the 20th century was getting us involved in World War I. Because I think World War I was, in the Versailles Treaty, was a con you know, led to World War II and the Middle East crisis and on and on. It just, just goes. But uh, exactly why they get into it, if there are other reasons, uh, they'd have to tell you. And I would go out of my way. That was one of my uh, one of my proposals uh, as an interim step to get uh, a back uh, and get away from the Federal Reserve System. But to have a competing currency, and you alluded to this fact that one individual was promoting that in the marketplace, and it should be legal, you know, to allow people to do that. Even what he was doing is handicapped not only because the federal government didn't want the competition. But he was handicapped in the fact that uh, currently, if, if we anybody wants to do that, if you come to me and you buy a coin, I have to charge your sales tax. And then if that coin goes up in value according to the Federal Reserve notes, you have to pay a capital gains tax. Well, that's not money. So if we're to have a competing currency and get people to use it, you have to get rid of sales taxes and capital gains taxes. If there's any lawsuits, you get settled in ounces of gold or ounces of silver and not in Federal Reserve notes. And uh, people might start using it. If they don't, we don't worry about it. But I think as the dollar goes down, people, I think they would first start savings. If they would trust the people that's holding the bonds or the savings, whether it be private or, uh, or government, uh, our problem is that we have a lousy history. We used to have gold bonds in the government, and the courts ruled against the government paying in gold, and then ruled against corporations' obligation to pay in gold. So they're interfering with the contracts. But if we could get back to, you know, legalizing this contract and get rid of the taxes, I, I think it would be a major step. Then the next step to deal with the Federal Reserve would be to eliminate their power to monetize debt. You know, as long as politicians, you know, spend money and are allowed to spend money and they tax a lot and they borrow a lot and still don't have enough, if they can just literally create money out of thin air and send it over to the Treasury, you know, they're going to do it, and that's why you have these factions agreeing and compromising. Some people like war and some people like welfare. And some people, a few of us left, like freedom. And we don't want that. <laughs> Are there any here students or faculty that have questions that haven't yet been dealt with? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Paul, uh, states around the uh, na around the globe base their currency on the U.S. dollar. If uh, we were to follow your plan and uh, go back to the gold standard, what happens to international trade? What's your prediction there? Depends on how you do it. Uh, you know, if you did it tomorrow, like I said, I'm not for that. It can be very, very chaotic. That's what the British did after uh, World War One. They went back on the gold standard. Uh, at a fictitious value. The market had already discounted it at the original value. They had already inflated their currency, so it was an artificial value, and it was a big problem. So it's the way you do it. Now, after the, uh, after the uh, Civil War, uh, we had the inflation of the Civil War, and we were off the gold standard. And uh, with the Resumption Act, it was a three-year period, and the promise that they would restore uh, convertibility and we weren't going to print any more money. We didn't have a warfare welfare state. The people believed it, and it was a non-event. We went back to it. So it depends on how you do it. But let's say we get to the point where we have a gold standard. It just means you have a stronger currency. Uh, and, uh, and to me, it's stability. I don't think it ever benefits anybody to have a weak currency, although economists argue the case, 
well, we've got to weaken the currency to increase our exports. Well, that lasts for about a week or so until our prices go up, you know, or the cost of the imports go up and then, it, then it, uh, it, it, there's no true benefit. But I, I think uh, it would be not as good, but if we were the leader, other countries would do it and they would follow our way. Uh, but but if, uh, if we did it alone, I think it's, it's conceivable. It's just that your dollar would buy so much more. And uh, it also means that we couldn't spend beyond our means anymore. We couldn't print money and just export it and go into huge debt. We would quit going into debt. It would be a tremendous benefit to us, even though it would appear that our standard of living would be moderated. There'd be no more booms, but of course there would be no more busts. Uh, but other countries, depending on what they did, would determine what would happen. Some would all of a sudden adjust and you want to tie their currencies to the dollar, which means they would have to do the same thing. Oh, uh, do you think that uh, terminally ill patients should be given access to experimental medication that's been approved for human testing? Patients that have exhausted all other uh, medical options? Um, I think all medications should be done by freedom of choice, whether you're sick or not or whatever. But you can't have a doctor or the person given the medication uh, lie to you or commit fraud. But if I think this, I think your point is a very important point because there's pretty good evidence in many cases where our FDA impedes progress uh, and denies benefits uh, to a lot of people because they're waiting for it to become safe and effective. But you know, there are drugs out there that may well be very good drug, but it might take us 20 years to find out. And uh, as long as the uh, researcher's up front and doesn't lie to us and say, oh, I'm going to cure your cancer, here, give me $20,000. If, if there's a medication, it's a legitimate chance, and whether you're dying or not, but especially if a person is going to die with a serious illness, they may say, well, I have a chance but I may serve mankind by being a voluntary experiment, you know, a guinea pig in a way. Let it happen, let it try. But to be denied this, uh, this whole idea that we have accepted the role that the government's the nanny state and makes all these decisions on everything we eat, drink, and smoke. And, uh, and not, I mean, we don't even let people, you know, smoke marijuana if it would help them with their getting cancer treatment. They might be able to eat better. and and uh, achieve something. And uh, so, no, those choices should be done uh, voluntarily and we should get the government out of the way. Uh, so you propose relinquishing many of the executive powers and returning a lot of power back to Congress. Now, as you propose to relinquish your powers, if we have a reluctant Congress, Obviously, it's our job to get Congress on the ball and start re-administering these powers. What real policy proposals or constitutional amendments would you propose um, so that there isn't an even greater ambiguity as there was a, a transition of rights and responsibilities amongst government, government branches? I, I'm not sure I can think of it anything in particular what you're thinking about, but uh, you know, if I want the power, the war powers to be assumed by the Congress and they're reluctant, good, we won't have a war. <laughs> but if it's something important, you know, in a movement towards sound money, I'm going to be very energetic. You know, I'm going to be talking to them in a very sincere manner, try to explain to those who represent the poor people, why inflation is eating the poor people up, you know, and they're the ones who suffer, and it's really a tax. So it would be persuasion and actually economic policy and common sense. But uh, it, uh, some of these things, it would be just as well that they, they not do it, and the president quit doing it, and the country would be better off. <laughs> I was just curious if um, you support enforcing antitrust laws to keep free market values, um, to keep insure competition and driving down prices while up in quality. Enforcing antitrust laws. Okay, I, I don't think I got that whole question. What, what subject are you talking about? Driving down prices? Um, do you support enforcing? 
were some antitrust laws too. Oh, antitrust laws? Yes. Uh, but uh, I don't like antitrust laws. Uh, most there are quite a few good textbooks out on uh, on antitrust, and most trust, most big uh, corporations that get control, most monopolies have come about through government, government rules, you know, whether it's the uh, communications industry. Uh, so there, there's, uh, some people claim there's never been a true free market monopoly. The most important thing is you, you always have free entry into the market. There are some people who get a big hunk of an industry. You know, recently we had uh, some small business people <coughs> filed a lawsuit against uh, Bill Gates, and they said he was too big. But it wasn't filed by the average consumer. The, the consumer loved what he was doing, and they were buying his product, and it made him a billionaire. You know, so you say, well, we got to get rid of him. He's too rich. But as long as there's a free entry and somebody can compete with him, who, was, who filed the suit? His competitors filed the suit. So uh, most, most of these big organizations that uh, get that way usually get help. I mean, in a way, the banking system is a cartel. You know, because because government's so much involved, and they become part of the Federal Reserve System, and they're part of the process of increasing money. So, yeah, I, I would like to go after you know the banking cartel, especially the Federal Reserve cartel. So it depends on how the bigness comes. But basically, uh, the the antitrust laws uh, don't work that well. There's there's a there is an antitrust provision that means that doctors can't talk to each other when they negotiate contracts. Why, why aren't we allowed to talk to each other? And uh, I think we could work out the problem of, of malpractice insurance and malpractice. If doctors were allowed to talk together and talk with their patient and come up with a contract, but they're not legal. Oh, the patients can't sign anything and say that we will agree on what we will do if there's a bad outcome. And uh, I would think that should be legal and we should agree on the circumstances and maybe share and buy an insurance policy and have no-fault insurance. So no, I don't want these antitrust laws prohibiting people from solving some of, some of these problems. Uh, you have any glasses with the tag? Well, thank you, Dr. Paul. First of all, it's, uh, it's nice to talk to a presidential candidate. Six million dollars richer this week. <laughs> to a question about uh, recent, the recent Mike Huckabee ad. He quoted a bit of Sinclair Woods about uh, when fascism comes to this country, and I think maybe this quote is right, it will come, they toss around the flag. Uh, I think that's the, the quote. I was just wondering why you mentioned that. Was that like a tongue-in-cheek comment, or what do you, what does that uh, mean to you? Okay, well, unfortunately, it was a, it was a unfortunate comment made at the wrong time because I have no interest in addressing my opponents by name or whatever they do or their ads, but I was getting ready for an interview and they, they said, well, you're going to be on in a couple of minutes, but would you, we're on the news now, would you answer a quick question? Said, oh, okay. And then they popped it up about, about this ad and, uh, you know, told me about the, about the ad and, and they said, what's your comment? So this this uh, this thing flashed through my mind, you know, about it. It had nothing to do with nothing to do with Huckabee, but it has to do with my thoughts about what's happening in this country. Because I truly believe that fascism is coming. You know, whether it's the military approach and uh, in, in Mises, the great economist, have always has always talked about when socialism comes to this country, it's not going to be the ordinary socialism. It'll be more fascism. And I think of fascism is a tricky term because every time you say that word they think of, of Hitler you know but there's fascism where corporations are in bed with big government see if I if, if, if Sinclair Lewis had used the word corporatism it wouldn't have uh, inflamed anybody but you fascism people don't understand but corporatism and fascism to me is when governments and big business get together see I don't like I don't like, uh, you know, the Halliburtons uh, having monopoly uh, contracts, you know, this sort of thing. So that's what was on my mind, but it was, it was, it was rather quick. So I, I did believe the quote from, uh, uh, from Sinclair Lewis that it will be wrapped in the flag because I've talked about the Patriot Act. You know, here it is. 
Uh, I'm unpatriotic. I didn't vote for the Patriot Act, which is, you know, fascist in the sense that it's coming and they're going to take away uh, your liberties. I don't vote. They'll have resolutions that Dennis and I always, sometimes the two of us will be voting against it. It says, you know, we support the troops because the policy is wonderful. And we don't want to endorse the policy, so we said, oh, you guys don't even support the troops. So it's that patriotic thing, you know, if you're not patriotic, uh, you, you know, you don't support the troops, but you have to support the policy. So it's a trick, and it's always wrapped in patriotism. The other one is Samuel Johnson's uh, quote, uh, you know, about, uh, about patriotism. Patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. And uh, I run into a lot of that false patriotism and it's rather annoying. So that was a subtle thought. <laughs> that was a subtle thought that came to my mind that it ended up on television when, when it was applied to another person, which is not my method of, of doing things. I, I don't usually, I very rarely use, use another person's name. I'm looking at it philosophically more so. The uh, gentleman on the end and up against the wall. Uh, yeah, there's a gentleman in the front row who asked a question earlier about how would a president Paul interact with a Congress like we have now and be able to actually get things done? Well, I just wanted to comment that in the 2008 presidential election, there will also be 34 senatorial seats and all 435 representatives all up for election. So the people who are going to put Ron Paul into office are going to deal with that at the same time. And you're more than welcome to participate. <laughs> speculation and then people bend the rules and when they do they commit fraud uh, the Enron scandal was handled rather well without any new regulations uh, it was handled by anti uh, you know um, uh, laws against uh, fraud in Texas and, and they broke the law and they lied and they and the market dealt with it the market took the price down of the stock and the people who committed fraud were penalized and they didn't need Sarbanes-Oxley and uh, because you know, the SC, even the SEC uh, doesn't prevent these kind of problems, and I don't. I, no, the, I, I don't. I think the anti-fraud laws are what's to control this. The biggest fraud is the money fraud. Money fraud. <laughs> you know, we should be dealing with uh, the fraudulency of uh, creating money out of thin air. But uh, right now, you know, in the depression. That was one of the reasons that the Depression was prolonged, because they introduced a lot of these regulations which diminished the enthusiasm for businesses to get back on their feet. And right now, Sarbanes-Oxley is doing something very similar. A lot of our businesses, you know, very, very expensive to fulfill this role because the federal government is supposed to regulate these people who are making these decisions rather than the marketplace and fraud laws. And people are going overseas and, uh, and they're, they're, not or, they're not going to the New York Stock Exchange. I, I don't think our problem comes from lack of, of lack regulation at all. The corner here, the here. Uh, good evening, Dr. Paul. Uh, I'm from across the bridge in Vermont Law School. I drove here after my final to hear you speak. And uh, I wanted to ask you about a piece of legislation I, I recently talked to my senator about, House Resolution 1955, the Domestic uh, and Homegrown Terrorism Act that creates a commission to uh, study uh, 
uh, homegrown and domestic terrorism. Could you comment on the need for such a commission? Um, that was in the 1955? I believe it's 1955. Right. The Homegrown Terrorism Act. Correct. Uh, no, I, I, I'm sad, sad to say that I wasn't there for that particular vote. And, uh, but th this would have been a very, very easy no vote for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I have put a speech into the record explaining if I had been here, I, I would have been voted no and, and talk about it. But it's very, very dangerous expanding uh, this definition of people who might be associated with terrorists. Anybody who facilitates uh, uh, violence or terrorism can be accused of committing a crime. But what does this mean to facilitate? You know, uh, and it really opened up the door for the for the government to be even more invasive in what we're doing on our telephones and on our internet. And uh, it, it's expansion of sort of the military uh, tribunals, you know. So uh, it's, it's part of this process that we talked about, and uh, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's an unconstitutional act. It shouldn't have been passed. And I would do whatever I could to get rid of it. We can still stop it. <laughs> Going into the Senate. Yeah, let's well, yeah, so, hope so. Yeah, you gotta, you got to write some new new. You just wrote me a letter. Dr. Paul? Yes. Like, yeah, I I have a two-part question. Uh, you're a well-known opponent of the Federal Reserve for good reasons. Uh, there's diverse monetary depredations that they commit upon our country, uh, not the least of which is establishing a private money interest, which charges interest on money created out of thin air, as well as the resulting inflation. My first question is, is the Fed constitutional or not, and why? And the second part is, considering that the Fed is sanctioned by the uh, Supreme Court, uh, how would you fight a judicial monopoly that sanctions it? Uh, well, it is, in con it is not constitutional, and we should uh, get rid of it. And we would have trouble with the courts until we have uh, uh, a consensus from the people and the Congress. I mean, if we had the right Congress, and the right president, we would pass legislation, and uh, we would develop a transitional period and get rid of it and change the tax laws and allow go to uh, replace the paper standard. But but you're right. I mean, with a bad court, it's practically impossible if we're dependent on it. This is why I mentioned, you know, the courts in the 30s. Uh, the government didn't have to pay in gold. And they even ruled that the private companies didn't have to pay in gold. The government's supposed to be there. If, if we're going to have a government, the role ought to be to enforce contracts, not, not uh, you know, reject them. So uh, you, just, you describe the problem. But the ultimate answer to that is to get an understanding. Uh, and it might take, you know, I would like to do it in a week or two, but it's not going to happen. But it might take a generation of young people like this to uh, understand the law and to be in positions and run for Congress and run for the Senate or whatever and, and to put pressure on our current members of Congress to understand it. But uh, it's, it's going to take a while. Now, the only... The only reason why it might come sooner than waiting a while longer is, is that we'll, we might have a financial crisis, we will have a financial crisis, then we will have an opportunity to, to offer our viewpoints. But once again, they have to endorse them. If, if not, uh, you know, things will get, get much worse. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's not, very, not very easy to do. But one thing I have been encouraged on this issue as I've gone around the country uh, and talked to college campuses, I thought I was the only one who was interested in the monetary issue. But believe me, this is the first time it's probably been talked about in over 100 years in the presidential campaign. I'm going to keep talking about it. But on college campuses, it's one of the loudest applause I get when I go after the monetary standard and you know the, the Federal Reserve. I was on the, when I first noticed that there was something was stirring was several months ago, I was at the University of Southern California. And, uh, well, they probably don't care about the Federal Reserve. There's just a few of us. I got the loudest applause and standing ovation when I went after the Federal Reserve. These are college kids. So, so that new generation is actually thinking about a lot more than the current generation of members of Congress that we have today because they're not interested in the subject. And it's not that they're hostile. It's just that they don't have that much interest or understanding in it, and they just sort of ignore the whole thing. 
Um, we've committed to end this thing at 8.30, so I can only take one more since Congressman gives real answers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I understand that you're a huge cycling enthusiast. Uh, what, what kind of cycling do you like to do, and do you have any favorite places? That <laughs> well, that's a that's a pretty benign question. I hope I don't fluff it. <laughs> well, I I'm not an expert. I don't go on real long distances. I have one of those hybrid bikes that you can ride around town. Uh, but I love the outdoors. I've ridden up in the mountains. Uh, I've never ridden in the mountains here. I would like to do that someday, but not in weather like this. <laughs> I've been in the mountains in Colorado on occasion. And, but I, when, I, when I have the opportunity, whether I'm in D.C. or in, in, in Texas, I do have a bike. And uh, my exercise habits, which have been absolutely interrupted lately, uh, I usually walk three miles in the morning and get out and get my head cleared up. Then in the evening, I will ride about 10 to 15 miles, and it's very relaxing for me. I will, on occasion, ride an exercise indoors, but that is boring. <laughs> I want to be outdoors and enjoy the outdoors. Thanks for that very easy question. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.